Good evening. Gene Oller here at Word of Hope Church in Katy's, Kentucky. Glad you guys have chose to join us in person as well as on Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can meet together through a lot of different ways now, Lord. For those that came out tonight and, uh, you know, prioritize, schedule uh, their Saturday evening to come to your house, Lord, and spend time corporately praying together and believing you, Lord, for the needs to be met, Lord, for the problems in our world, for the church, Lord, for the lost, for the sick. Lord, I appreciate that. And then those who join uh, through Facebook and, Lord, through Zoom, uh, Lord, I pray you bless them as well for their commitment to you. We thank you, Father, that the gospel uh, does go beyond the walls of the local church. Lord, we pray, God, that you would help us tonight. Uh, somebody said, Lord, uh, what am I going to talk about tonight? And I said, well, prayer. Because, Lord, that's what we do on Saturday evenings. We come together and pray. And, Lord, we're so glad that when we pray, Lord, we know that we're heard. Lord, that you hear the prayers of your people. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks once again for those in person and those on the Internet watching. Uh, tonight's message is prayer is a good use of time. Prayer is a good use of time. I would think that there are many in the world who actually believe it's a waste of time. And I've had that expressed to me. Uh, Dutch Sheets, uh, on his daily devotional that he does, talked about that in the church he pastored at one time, he stopped everything in the church. And for 90 days, all those service times and activities were dedicated to praise and worship. Praise and worship. That's what they did in all those times. And one of the... Uh, Significant people in that church came to him and chewed him out and said the last 90 days has been a waste of time. And for Brother Sheets, he said that that 90 days was the greatest time of my life. And so not everybody sees prayer, uh, you know, as uh, uh, something that really matters. I believe it was John Wesley that says we are to pray like nothing we do can help and we are to work like prayers can't help. And that may seem strange, but we ought to pray hard we ought to work hard is what he was saying. We need to pray hard and believe God, and we need to do whatever it is we can do and labor for the Lord. So prayer is a good use of time. Um, time spent alone with God is not a waste. It changes us. It changes our surroundings. And every Christian who would live the life that counts and who would have power for service must take time to pray. And, and that was Emmy Adros that said that. Uh, famous quote from that individual. Jeremiah 21, 12 says... Then you will call upon me and come and pray to God and he will listen to you. Then you will call on God and come and pray to God and he will listen to you. Jeremiah 21, 12. And then Jeremiah 33, 3. Of course, that's, uh, uh, well, it says, Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. And the first verse says that if we, if we will pray, God will hear us. And it says, come and pray to God. I, I think it's fine to pray when you drive. It's fine to pray uh, on the fly. It's fine to pray, you know, when something's going wrong and you work at the factory and the machine's acting up or, or you get a text or something. That's all good. But come and pray and God will listen to you. I think prayer needs to be a priority in our lives. It really needs to be something like like we, we, uh, we have things we do. Some people can't start the day without coffee. And there are some people I know that spend a significant time in the morning uh, sipping on coffee and just sitting there, uh, maybe uh, reading the Word of God, but some just spend time with their cup of coffee. Uh, I think we ought to spend time with God. I drink coffee myself, but time with God. We need to make time for God, and we'll end this message with a, a little slogan along the lines of when we should pray. But uh, uh, he said if we'll call on God and come and pray to God, he will listen to you. God wants to listen to you. A lot of times people could care less. I notice when people greet each other, it's interesting. I, uh, you know, somebody will say, uh, maybe at Walmart, where they say, hey man, how you doing? And the other person doesn't answer a lot of times. They'll say back to them, uh, you know, something towards them, but we don't actually answer that question. Hey, man, how you doing? Oh, everything's good. Uh, you know, what's been going on with you? What's up, man? You know, that kind of stuff. And we don't really talk about the problems. And quite frankly, 
People don't really want to hear about your problems. They don't really care if you tell them about a surgery you have, you had, and uh, the difficulty you had. They'll start telling you about uh, their battle wounds and surgeries. You know, we talk about uh, weather, we talk about things, but but not really anything all that important. A lot of times, God is concerned about everything in our lives, the big things and the little things. God has the power to change things in our lives, and prayer for many doesn't make a difference. I have many friends, and in fact, there's, you know, large segment of the Christian world that believes God is going to do what God is going to do anyway. He's a sovereign God. He's going to do what he's going to do anyway. He's going to save you. He's going to save you. He's going to uh, send a storm. If he's going to send a storm, he's going to calm a storm. If he's going to calm a storm. And yet we see in the life of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the scriptures in general, that prayer makes a difference. It changes things. But for people that don't believe it does, it's just a formality. It's something they do. Actually, it's not a personal relationship with the Father at all. It's just saying, well, I'm here and it is what it is. And God's sovereign. He's going to work it according to his plan. God's going to work everything out the way he wants to. And the Bible teaches absolutely the opposite. We must pray to see things done. We must pray to see the world change. We must, when Jesus looked at, you know, a harvest of souls, and we'll talk about that again, but, but he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers. He wasn't being uh, just being quaint or just saying something uh, to say it. He was saying, guys, if you'll pray, the Lord will send hard, uh, uh, people to labor in the harvest. If we don't pray, things don't happen. Things don't change. Prayer is so important. You and I have an opportunity to talk to the creator of the universe. I mean, the one who knows everything. The one, is cap the one who's capable of everything. And, and he wants us to call on him so that so that he'll hear us and listen to us. Can you imagine? God wants to listen to me and you. Jeremiah 21, 12 again. Then you will call on God and come and pray to him and he will listen to you. I think that we ought to make a significant amount of time, private time with God on a daily basis. And then the other one I read, Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Let me tell you something. God knows everything. And God likes to teach his children. God enjoys telling stories to his kids. And if you'll spend time in prayer with God, he will unravel mysteries. If you read in the scriptures and you say, boy, I really don't get that story. I don't understand that parable. I, I don't know what that verse means. Well, we have an opportunity to go to the author of these things and talk with him and he'll show us things that we have not known he'll teach us things and uh, you know God is looking for hungry people God is looking for hungry people and uh, did you turn off the can lights good those of you on Facebook saw my face just go from bright red to to the right color uh, yeah those can lights really make it give me a sunburn I look like I've been in Florida for a while I thought something was uh, funny I saw them go out. So I'm glad you did that, Jack. But uh, Jesus told the parable of the sower. And I won't go through the parable. It's Mark, the fourth chapter. And, and I love what happened there in one way. In another way, it's kind of sad. <laughs> he told the story. And when he finished telling the story, most people said, great sermon, and left. I mean, they didn't really do that. But it says he stopped teaching. And, and apparently they left because it says the disciples and a group of others came to him after that and said, would you tell us what that means? Mm -hmm. it, it was a few out of the many. Most of them thought, that's great, awesome. Another story about uh, so and something. And then Jesus said, it's given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom. They prayed is what they did. They went to Jesus, who's God, and they asked him a question about something that he spoke, his word. And he said, oh my goodness. To you, it's given to know the secrets of the kingdom. What, what, to who? To the ones who linger a little longer. To the ones who ask him. To the ones that, that say, God, I, I want to know what your word means. I, I want to I know how to apply that truth to my life. Not, by the way, how to apply that to somebody else. Not so you can see what's wrong with other people. But so you can see what's wrong with you. Or maybe just something else you need to learn. It's not meant to be so I know more than somebody else. 
Well, I tell you what, God wants us to know. So then he told them what the parable was all about. The disciples and this other group, we don't know who they were. And he said, you guys will know the secret of the kingdom. He also said, if you understand this parable, you'll understand my other parables. If you don't understand the other parables that Jesus taught, you need to go to that parable, Mark the fourth chapter, and study that and ask God to tell you what it means. Because Jesus said, when you understand this one, you'll understand all of them. Isn't that interesting? Do you think that just was for the few people that were listening? Or is it in the word of God for us today? You see, he said in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to him, or call to me, God said this first person, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. And so then he explained that parable to those folks. And then whenever they told another parable, what happened? They go, oh, wow, I understand what he's talking about. Because Jesus said that would be the result of understanding this one. And so uh, that's, that's going to take a little more. That's more than now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to take to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's not prayers. That's little things we teach kids. But that's not prayer. It's not going to bring much into your life. It's not a, you're not going to find the mysteries of God uh, out of that sort of prayer. Learning to pray is like learning a trade. We're an apprentice and we must serve time in it. Constant care, practice, and time are needed to become a skillful prayer. Dick Houston said that. I, I think that uh, we take prayer for granted. Uh, certainly, wherever you're at in your walk, you can pray. I got born again. I didn't know anything about God. I, I thought he was a judge somewhere far away and I was in trouble. And uh, I just finally got saved and didn't want to go to hell. And uh, I was tired of the way I lived. I was a miserable person. I've been miserable for years, and I was young. And uh, I prayed, God, a good prayer. God, if there is a God, I've messed up my life. If you'll help me, I'll live for you the rest of my life. And I got born again that night. I've been free from drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, adultery, fornication, and all kinds of other sins. Still not perfect, but uh, the list is far smaller. God used to work on me with a bulldozer. And now I think he still works on me with a shovel and a pick a little bit. He's not having to use quite as heavy equipment as he once did. I've got a long way to go, but he's brought me a long way. Later that night, I couldn't sleep. First time that I tried to sleep without the use of drugs in a long time. So I prayed again. Uh, God will help me. I'll burn every bridge. I'll break every relationship. And I'll live for you the rest of my life. And I didn't know anything about prayer. And I didn't know how to address God. But uh, God helped me. And he's kept me. God is faithful. I prayed a lot of prayers that weren't very smart prayers. I prayed some things that weren't, weren't right. I didn't know what the scripture taught along the way over the years. But we can learn about prayer. We can learn to pray effectively. Let me say this about prayer. Prayer is not how good your prayer sounds. That's what we think sometimes. It sounds good. That's really not what it's all about. Uh, we can pray anywhere for anything. Hezekiah prayed on his deathbed. Uh, Jesus prayed in the wilderness and a lot of other places too, by the way. Daniel prayed in the lion's den. Elijah prayed for fire to come down. And the three Hebrew, three Hebrew, three Hebrew children prayed for no fire. <laughs> they went through the fire anyway, and God gave them the victory. Uh, when we go through the scriptures, we can see people pray in all kinds of circumstances and situations. We can pray about anything, anywhere, anytime with God. And I want to tell you this. I believe that answers to prayer in public are the result of private time with God where, you, where you've worked out the things, you've heard his voice, or you've waited silently before God. You've given him time and asked him to teach you, to show you, to lead you, to guide you. And sometimes he'll tell you what to go do. Sometimes you'll just know when you get there. And I know this is so because that's what Christ demonstrated. Prayer is actually, there are 66 books of the Bible. 30 books of the Bible actually have prayer in them. 30 out of 36 have actual prayers. Now, out of the other 36, there are no prayers, but there are teachings about prayer. There are comments about prayer, but they're not actual prayers being prayed. And that's not good or bad, it's just a fact. Uh, you know, knowing about prayer then is incredibly important rather than 
rather the scriptures demonstrate it through we see prayers like the prayer of Jabez, a short prayer that God answered and blessed him and enlarged his borders. And, and we see that prayer of Hezekiah when he, he gets his life. Uh, the prophet comes and says, you're going to die now. And set your house in order. He prays about a 38-word prayer, I believe, towards the wall. And God tells the prophet, go back and I'll give you uh, 15 more years. 15 more years. And so a short prayer brought a great answer. And many times that's the case. But a lifestyle of prayer is prepared to meet whatever comes up during the day. And I think it's important to spend time with God in prayer. Jesus taught some things about prayer. Uh, Jesus said to pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. He didn't say treat them bad. He said pray for them. Matthew 5, 44, I tell you, Jesus said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Don't be sarcastic and say, I love them, but I don't like them. It's nothing but pure sarcasm when you do that. It's an affront to the Lord. He means love them. Love them like God has loved me and you. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Bless them. Now, sometimes I've heard people say, bless them in a way that I don't think that was very positive. He means bless them that curse you. Do something good for them. Really, huh? It says do good to them that hate you. Do good to them that hate Not just, okay, I've got a good attitude. No, it says do good to them that hate you. It's hard to do good to people that hate you sometimes because they'll throw it right back at you, but nevertheless. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The person you can't stand, the one you're offended at, the one that you think is a hypocrite, not living right and not doing right, and you just don't like them. That's the kind of things God says for you to do for that person. And sometimes that's challenging. But God wants prayer to change me and you. We need to be changed. Jesus talked about hypocrites and they're praying long in Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. For I say to you, they already have their reward. And then Jesus talked about praying in the closed closet. Closet prayers, Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you shut the door, pray to your Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. So he talks about two different kinds of prayers. One is the hypocritical person that has a public prayer life to be seen and heard, but doesn't have a private prayer life. They're not really alone with God. They're not in fellowship with God. They're going through the motions of prayer because they want to look good, you know. They want people to think, man, they really do good prayers. They pray great prayers, but they're not spending time alone with God. And then the other person is the, the righteous person, the one they're spending time with God, and ultimately their public prayers typically will not be very long. And that's what Jesus demonstrated. I went up in the mountain and prayed all night, uh, went up a good, time, a good while before daylight and prayed, went alone to pray. We find repeatedly Jesus prayed. And sometimes it took the disciples, sometimes it took three of them, sometimes all by himself, and he prayed a lot. And then when he raised the dead, he th said things like, Father, uh, you know, I'm not really praying for my benefit or yours, but I'm praying for these that are here. I mean, that's recorded in Scripture. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. It wasn't a whole lot of screaming or gyrations or, or casting out the devil or anything. Not that that's wrong. Sometimes devils need to be cast out. He cast them out. But he cast them out with just a few words. But it's because he'd already spent multitudes of hours with the Father. Oh, it's because he's the Son of God. No, it's because he spent multitude of hours with his Father. He loved to be with his Father. And you and I, if we're going to have an effective prayer life that's going to help people, it's not how much praying we do in public. It's how much we do in private. Jesus talked about pointless prayers. Some prayers are pointless. They're valueless. They're not going to make any difference. Matthew 6, 7 and 9. But when you pray, don't use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Be not like them, for you, your Father, knows what things you have need of before you ask. Now, it doesn't mean we don't ask. Uh, sometimes people say, well, then should, should we, you know, maybe we shouldn't ask. Well, then he goes on and says, uh, when he was teaching on prayer, he gave them the Lord's Prayer. 
gives us you know, 22 points, relevant points in that prayer. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer in Matthew. I'm not going to read it. Got part of it down, but I'm not going to read it. But you know the Lord's Prayer. So, so in that prayer, uh, Lord, give us our daily needs. It does cover that. But yet, uh, you know, to pray, uh, vain repetitions. Now, I don't think it's wrong to pray prayers out of prayer books if you want to do that as a part of your prayer time. I don't think that's wrong. I have found prayers of other people that I have taken before the Lord and prayed. You know, I thought, man, this person, they prayed about this issue. But that's a whole lot different than a person's prayer life is based upon a text where they're reading prayer books counting that as their prayer. That's a child who's talking to his father and saying, Lord, I want, us, I want you to see this prayer that this person prayed. And I, 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 wanna, I want you to, Lord, help me to understand that sort of life, that sort of prayer life. You know, the prayers of the Desert Fathers. We did a Bible study last year and uh, being emotionally, spiritually healthy. And, and there were some prayers in there and things that people prayed about. And I prayed about some of those things with the Lord in my private time. That's not what he's talking about. But somebody whose prayer life is just uh, reading of text and, and going through emotion over in uh, Tibet where Brother Larry Mead does missions work sometimes. Uh, some of the Buddhists there had the prayer wheel. Anybody ever seen a prayer wheel? It's a stick, and it's got a, a wooden thing on top, and it may be ornate, or it may have, like, loose beads on it. It may have things that fly out, and they will spin it, and they will walk in a circle. I think they have to walk counterclockwise, but I don't remember. And they spin the wheel the other way, and that wheel represents their prayers. That's, that's prayers, meditations being offered to somebody, you, you know, uh, because they don't, they don't believe in God, by the way. Buddhists don't worship God. It's kind of interesting, but it's not a worship of a God. Ultimately, it's a worship of self, but it doesn't appear to be. It seems to be very humble. But they spin that wheel. One time, Larry asked the man if, if he could buy his prayer wheel, and the man wouldn't sell it for any amount of money. The man had spent thousands of hours spinning that wheel as prayers. And guess how many of those ever got answered? Zero. Zero. Was that man sincere? Yeah. Was he devout? I mean, they spend hours a day, some of them will, walking in a circle and spinning that wheel and sometimes chanting or saying things, but the wheel is the prayers that they offer up. You know, vain prayers. If you want to know about prayer, you have to look in the Word of God because the Word of God teaches a lot about it. <coughs> uh, so, is, uh, he said, your father already knows what you have need of. That doesn't mean we don't ever ask him, because then he goes off the Lord's Prayer, which talks about doing that. In Matthew 9, 38, uh, Jesus uh, is, he offered up a prayer, uh, you know, for souls, but he prays it differently. Uh, how many of us ever prayed that people would get saved? And I certainly do that. I'm not going to say it's totally wrong, but in Mark 9, 38, Jesus said, we Pray ye therefore to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. See, they looked, and, and they looked at the fields. If you go to chapter 9 of Matthew and read the whole story, and, and they saw that he was doing a metaphor of farm crops, of corn growing, and lost souls. And so, so they're looking at this with his disciples, and, and you know, he didn't say, pray that the corn will get harvested. Uh, he didn't say, pray that these souls will get saved really didn't say pray that way. He said pray for laborers. How I many of you know that's still the problem today? I mean, we don't have laborers. We don't have people going out into the harvest field of the world asking people, explaining the gospel, and asking them if they would receive Christ right now. Sometimes we'll say, God bless you, and I'm okay with that, but that's not sharing your faith. That's sharing your blessings. Thank God for blessings. We, we, we will say, I'll pray for you, Many people would say, I'll pray for you now. And that's all great. But it doesn't lead to salvation unless you explain to a person what it is to not know Christ and how to repent of their sins and give their heart to Christ and become born again. Uh, you know, maybe we leave and they felt better. It may be a tragedy for a sinner to know a saint who they're encouraged to be around that person and yet that person never explains to them their lost condition 
their need of a personal relationship with God and lead them in that direction. Now, they've got to choose for themselves, but, but to literally try to lead them to know Christ. Sometimes it's much easier to say, I bless you. Well, Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. So when we pray for souls, I think it's good. God send laborers. We've got James with us. He's going to be in service tomorrow. He's going to go to the country of Wales to minister there. He's done missionary work in several other countries, by the way. And he's a laborer in the harvest field. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for others. We need to pray maybe God wants us to be a laborer. Let me see. Running out of time, aren't we? Uh, Jesus had something. Uh, he had prayers for air traffic. Are you okay with a smile? Prayer, Jesus' prayer on the subject of air traffic. In Matthew 24, 20, Jesus said, Pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He was talking about, you know, Israel, the last days. Uh, you know, pray that the flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He said about temptation, Matthew 26, Watch and pray that you are not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus uh, offered up prayer or, didn't, or, or instruction on prayer for desire. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Jesus offered up prayer for discouragement in uh, Luke 18, 1. And he, and he spoke a parable unto them to this end that men are always to pray and not faith. I have Siri uh, quoting scriptures in my ears. We're good now? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> that was bizarre. Uh, on discouragement, uh, he said, pray. Men are to always pray and not faith. Faith means to become overwhelmed with discouragement. With discouragement. And then in closing, in Revelation 5, 8, uh, prayers, God records your prayers. God saves your prayers. Prayers are accumulated. They add up. Revelation 5, 8, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, sweet smells, which are the prayers of saints. In Revelation 8, 3, another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him more incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And Revelation 8, 4, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angels' hands. Isn't that interesting? That your prayers are being stored up in, in heaven. And at times, they are added to an incense burner that is in the form of more incense that go up before God. Isn't that incredible? One of the most powerful uh, senses that we have is smell. Now, we, we're very underdeveloped in our modern world, but smell is so powerful. My mother wore a particular powder from Avon all my life, and I never paid any attention to that scent, that smell. But uh, when my mama died, I took that powder box and some of her perfume, and I put it in a box, and I kept it. And uh, it's been a long time now. She's been gone since uh, 98. But occasionally I would open that, just open the box. You didn't even have to touch the powder and stuff. And I could smell that smell. But what I noticed was, was I would be at Walmart or Kroger, and I would smell that scent of my mother. And instantly when, you know, I would, I'd be thinking about tomatoes or, or cabbage or canned goods or, or hurrying up getting out of the store. But I would smell that. So a lot of times, I would walk down the aisle, and I could follow that smell to that person. And usually, it would be an older lady, and I never said anything to them. But that that scent uh, was very powerful to all of a sudden remind me of my mother. Now, maybe you think that's weird. But maybe you've experienced it. But I never paid attention to how my mother smelled until after she died. And then that I would smell that scent. And I noticed it on her clothes when Dad had me clean out you know, her closet and things. I could, I, that, that aroma, that smell. Here it talks about how powerful that your prayers are, that God so loves the prayers of his people that he has them converted over into odors, 
uh, vile, full of odors, the scent, the smell of his people. I believe that God could smell that incense when it's poured into this metal thing that would burn incense in heaven and an angel holds it and it ascends up into God and breathes that. Isn't that something? I think he smells whose prayers they are. I think he understands the aroma of what was going on in a person's life. I mean, I don't know. I'm just telling you what I think about that. But it is evidently clear that God not only records the prayers, but he has those converted into scents and smells that remain in heaven. And so prayers then accumulate. They accumulate in heaven. Well, uh, wow. Prayers are for now and they're for later. How many of you ever eat that kind of candy? Now and forever. Or now and later. Say it. Now or later. Now or later. Yeah. In John 17, 20, 21. Neither pray I for these alone. This is the longest prayer in the Bible. It's Jesus' prayer. And it wasn't just for his disciples. I'm not just praying for these that hear me. He's praying and they're hearing him. He's talking to the Father. But also for those that should believe on my name through their word. The words of not just the apostles, but all the people that were his followers that were present in this moment. Those that were there, that were followers, that they would be one, that we would walk in unity. As you, Father, and I am one, that they may also be one with us, that we would be one together as his body and one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus prayed for those that were with him. He prayed for those who would come later. Prayers, you know, reach into our future. When you pray today, some of your prayers may not be answered during your lifetime. Some of us, unbeknown to us, but in heaven we'll find out, we are the result of people before us that prayed and cried out to God. We may not even be born yet, but their prayers somehow have an, have an enormous impact. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a bunch because I went way over. I always think the sermon won't be long enough. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Prayer is an opportunity to speak back to God, to request of God what he's already recorded in his word, what his will and purpose is. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, pray for the return of Christ, or pray for the sick. Not only are we commanded to pray for the sick, and the prayer of faith will, will save them, James 5 says, but we see that it was his will, that he went around doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. We can pray against the oppression of the devil. We're praying according to his will. We can pray all the things that are prayed. We can pray those because the word is his will. And then I said I would talk to you a little bit about time. Uh, let me just say this. Prayers in the morning time, before I start my day. Now, your day may start at a different time because of schedules. But when you're starting your day, whenever that might be, some people are getting off work at 5 a.m., so that's the end of their day. When you start your day, when you awake to face today, I think it's the most important time for you to pray. If you pray before you face today, you're preparing yourself. You're putting on the armor of God. You're connecting with God who might give you directions and instructions and promptings and leader, leadings of the Holy Spirit in a particular direction that might be gravely beneficial to you that day. Praying at night, that's a good time to give thanks for what God has done. That's a good time to give thanks for what God has done all day long. Praise in the evening, at the end of our day, and morning time, praise, worshiping God, but also seeking guidance and direction and help and wisdom and strength for that 12, 18 hour period ahead of you. Uh, if we don't start our day with prayer, then I believe we will pray at night. Our prayers at night will simply be damage control. If we don't start our days with prayer, then we're going to fumble through the day spiritually. And when we get to bed tonight, we're going to say, Oh, God, I hope I never have a day like this again. Lord, I pray that you'll help me in the job situation. i got to go back in there tomorrow. It didn't work out. I pray you help me with my family. We're praying at the wrong time. If you start your day, Lord, I got, I got going in today. I pray for your help. I ask you to guard my heart and mind. Lord, help me with that. I pray for my kids. I, you know, whatever your prayers might be. You pray ahead of time. You pray ahead of time for your family and friends today whenever it starts, too. I know Joe's going to work. I just got off. But I know he's coming to work. And 
Lord, I ask you to help Joe and bless Joe and, and help him uh, walk in that path of righteousness today. It's either that or when the day's over, we're praying, we're looking back at the mess and saying, God, uh, straighten out the mess. It matters when you pray. Now, I will want to say that we ought to pray always for everything all the time, but you need a time alone with God. I think of the morning is worth that, whatever it takes to adjust our time. But whenever you pray, uh, learn to pray from the scriptures. The only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them, only one thing, and it was, Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for this opportunity to preach and teach about prayer. Lord, we're in our prayer time. I ran over a little bit. But, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, maybe this message really applies to somebody. I pray, God, that it would have your full desire in their life. Maybe somebody else doesn't need it at all, and I pray they just would be happy anyway. But, Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching and you want to, uh, we're fixing to do corporate prayer here in the church, and we'll pray over your needs. So if you want to text us or message us a prayer or put it in comments, we'll be praying uh, for you guys over the next hour. God bless you, and thanks for joining us.